You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Right. So, um, welcome back to our um, orientation series. Um, today, we're going to be talking about clinical management of atopic dermatitis. This will be an interactive presentation. We have two speakers. Uh, I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics here in the Division of Allergy at Children's Mercy, and my co-presenter is... I'm Arthi Pandya. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at Children's Mercy Hospital and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Hi, Dr. Pandya. Hey, Dr. Pandya. I, I have these disclosures here. Um, as far as I know, you don't have any. Would you like some? Maybe um, in the next couple of years, I'll be cool like you and be able to get some disclosures behind my name. Oh, okay, good. I always am. It's always nice to have at least a few disclosures. These are our learning objectives. I like to start with a few scenarios, and I'm in, why don't we alternate reading these and discussing them? Um, I'll start. Um, the question is, is this eczema? Because we have to make a diagnosis. Uh, an eight-month-old gets peanut butter on their arms and hands and shortly afterwards develops a blotchy red rash where it touched. The rash lasts for a few hours and then goes away. Per personally, this is not eczema. This is, um, this is actually food-induced uh, der dermatitis. It's a very common thing. A lot of kids, especially eight-month-olds, when they get food on their skin, they will develop a rash. It actually doesn't mean anything. The treatment is to wipe it off and not worry about it. You want to do the next one? Sure. You have a six-year-old um, who was told to wash their hands frequently. Now they have a rough, itchy rash on the back of their hands. Is so, that eczema? So with just that information alone, I wouldn't um, say that that's just eczema alone. There are a couple other things you would need to think about here. First, when you're talking about a, a rash on the hands like that, depending on the distribution on the hands, you do need to think about this hydrotic eczema. And then also you have um, hand washing dermatitis um, that can also develop with, as the vignette mentioned, frequent hand washing. So, you know, we will talk further about how atopic dermatitis is a, is a clinical um, diagnosis and how it requires more than just this limited information to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. Yeah, a lot of people call it hand dermatitis, uh, dyshydrotic eczema, there's all kinds of names. But yeah, it's pretty common, at this, especially with COVID, everybody's washing their hands. My hands look the same way, by the way, I have it too. 12-year-old um, has bumps on the back of their upper arms. It's not itchy, the bumps are noticeable. I have a lot of parents who come in and say, oh, my 12-year-old my, my has eczema, and they point to these little bumps on the upper arms. That's not eczema, that's mostly keratosis. Polaris, which is caused by enlarged hair follicles, but it's it's not an eczema problem. Uh, do you want to do the next one? Yep. Yeah. And then if I can make a point about keratosis pilaris, you know, sure. in older individuals, yes, the distribution can be at the back of the arms. It can be on the legs, but in younger kids, you can also get lesions on their face, their chest and abdomen, and it's not atopic dermatitis. You can also get these little keratosis pilaris lesions. Yep. Um, Okay, the vignette. The three year you have a three year old who gets slightly itchy, rough circular rash in the middle of their abdomen that is persistent. So I think there's a lot of things to think about with this. You know, although you can think about atopic dermatitis, you also got to think about, um, especially with the circular nature of the rash that was described, you have to think about fungal etiologies if they're having a fungal rash. Um, you can have atopic, derm uh, excuse me, contact dermatitis too, depending on um, if you have vesicular lesions, if there's something in particular that's either allergic or irritating to their skin, because you have irritant contact dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis. So I don't think this vignette alone would, you know, have me diagnose the patient as atopic dermatitis. 
Right. I mean, none of these are totally convincing because there's so limited information. Uh, I was kind of going for contact dermatitis due to nickel. A lot of times kids this age will be wearing blue jeans that have snaps in them and in the center of your abdomen, that's a good place to get a nickel rash. It's usually circular, um, but it could be many different things. Um, what about a four month old has rough, very itchy skin over a large part of their body with scalp flaking? Uh, this is often a pretty good description of atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, four month olds generally have it over large parts of their body and their scalp will often flake, which is seborrheic dermatitis, but that's a con that's also considered to be part of uh, eczema. Do <clears throat> you yes. have any thoughts? Nope, I agree with that, you know, um, especially co-evaluating and treating for seborrheic dermatitis if there's scalp of involvement. Um, okay, and then the last vignette, a three-year-old has rough itchy skin on their neck and in the antecubital and popliteal fossas during the winter. Great um, vignette that we have here. So a couple of things that you want to point out. You know, we'll talk about the, the characteristics of eczema, but certainly having cirrhotic, pruritic patches um, in this particular distribution, you do want to think about atopic dermatitis. So here we have a description of the flexural lesion, excuse me, flexural areas with the antecubital and popliteal fossa, fossae, um, uh, which is common as children get older. When you have kids that are younger with atopic dermatitis and they're crawling um, and they're not quite yet walking, it's more common to get it on the extensor surfaces as opposed to the flexural surfaces because that is the part of the skin that they're irritating more than the, the flexural areas. Um, but in this particular age group and as you get older, it moves to that distribution. So I would definitely consider atopic dermatitis for that last one. That, that's what I was going for. So. When I, I'm, well, I think it's this is not going to be an academic. Here's a meta analysis type of discussion. The two of us are going to talk about what we actually do in the clinic when we see a patient with suspected atopic dermatitis or eczema. And obviously, the first thing you do is you get a chief complaint. This is usually in the chart before the patient arrives in clinic. I look down the list of all the chief complaints to see what kinds of problems I'm likely to be seeing that day. And when I see a chief complaint in a six month old um, with bad rash and possible allergies, to me, I'm thinking, well, what kind of rash could a six month old get that is bad? And I mean, there's many different ones. It could be hives or any number of things, but I also think that he's probably gonna have atopic dermatitis. Um, it's possible that the parents may never have been given a correct diagnosis before, so they really don't know what this rash is. Sometimes they say, you know, kid with eczema, and they just call it that because their doctor told them, but a lot of times they don't know. Uh, here's the thing, when they, when I'm looking at the chart and thinking in the future, when the patient arrives, what am I going to have to deal with? Uh, I, most parents believe that a food is causing the rash. They just can't figure out which food it is and why they, that's why they're seeing you, because they want you to tell them what food is causing their child to have a rash. And uh, I'm immediately, I'm already starting to think about, well, would it be a food? Um, what are the odds that this family will believe that it's not a food if, if it turns out not to be? Uh, the bottom line is um, they're gonna be coming in very frustrated. Uh, they may report that the rash gets better with treatment, but then it comes right back after the treatment is stops and they're very frustrated. They want you to, to fix it so it doesn't come back. Um, what do you think when you see a chief complaint in the chart before they arrive? Yeah, I think, and all of those things I think are things for us to think about. And and there are management techniques that we can use um, to prevent a lot of the frustrations that parents have. Because I do agree with you. One of the big frustrations is they're fine when they're on this. They get bad when they're off. And I think you and I are, have both experienced this kind of topical steroid phobia that patients also have, you know, their, uh, excuse me, parents also have, you know, they're so scared of using these treatments long term for their kids. Um, so they stop it as soon as the kid gets better. And, you know, I'll mention in a couple later slides about how adherence plays a big barrier to um, 
optimal management of atopic dermatitis and in individuals who don't have a maintenance regimen plan, how that is a big pitfall of treatment with atopic dermatitis. And when you send them out with a maintenance plan, how that can prevent that particular frustration along mm-hmm. with appropriate education. Cause you're right. Most parents or, you know, even, um, you know, you have um, some primary clinicians or primary physicians who think that if it's atopic dermatitis, it must be food related. And once you cut out the food, everything gets better. And then you have the kid go through an extensive food diet where they eliminate foods and nothing gets better. So um, just knowing um, having the background of, you know, how we manage these patients and how to educate them, those those are important pitfalls um, of atopic dermatitis management. Bottom line is a lot of parents come in with um, unrealistic expectations and misinformation, and we just have to be prepared to to deal with that. So what what actually is atopic dermatitis, otherwise known as eczema? Uh, and, and these are uh, the actual features from the uh, literature that describe the features. This is one of the few academic slides. Uh, the essential features that must be present for a patient to have eczema is your skin has to itch. If you don't have itchy skin, you don't have eczema. Skin in eczema, by definition, must itch. In addition, there is usually a typical morphology. This can vary with age, and it can be different locations, the face, neck, extensors, and so on, and we'll talk about that. And the history is usually chronic or relapsing. It doesn't come, last a few weeks, and goes away and never comes back. That's not eczema. That's probably contact dermatitis or something else. But if it's chronic and relapsing, then that's uh, that fits the definition of atopic dermatitis. Thoughts? Yeah, uh, agreed with all of those. This is uh, generally a chronic inflammatory pruritic um, disease process, as you mentioned, all of those things. And there are some features that are different between kind of uh, acute versus chronic um, when yeah. when you're having, you know, when you have vesicular lesions, for instance, or, you know, erythematous papules with um, breaking open of the skin, you know, that could be more like acute or active. Um, and then with chronic atopic dermatitis, you can develop thickening of the skin, like kenification. Really, those things are just things to know, but um, it doesn't necessarily change your um, long-term management unless you're worried about an infection and evaluating for a secondary infection yeah, on top. Th- these are the features that must be present. There are yeah. also features that support the diagnosis. So yeah. it often starts early. Um, in addition, there's often a history of atopy, the personal or family history, uh, or and or a history of IgE reactivity. And um, generally, the skin is dry. Uh, sometimes the parents will say it's not dry, it's oily, but usually it's dry. Um, these support the diagnosis if the patient has eczema. And before we uh, stop going through this, there are also other associated features that are nonspecific but suggest the diagnosis. Um, typical, uh, this vascular response, I've never really appreciated that. I don't usually test for it, but keratosis Cholerus and pityriasis, these are other things that may be associated with atopic dermatitis, but I think of them as separate diseases. There may be ocular changes. There may be other changes as well in uh, like kenification, uh, things that you were talking about just, just now, Dr. Pandya. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can also get like fissuring of the skin and um, bleeding yes. too as well, depending on how bad it is. There's all kinds of things you can get, um, but there's a problem with the nomenclature. Uh, I once asked one of the experts, what's the difference between eczema and atopic dermatitis? And um, I think I got a just so story. It was just something that the expert made up because he didn't really know the difference. And a lot of times we're not very good with our nomenclature. Um, Eczema is really a description of what the skin looks like. It's not a disease. It's an eczematous rash, a rash that looks typical for eczema. And certainly atopic dermatitis is associated with an eczematous skin. But this dyshydrotic dermatitis, the hand dermatitis, uh, technically is not atopic dermatitis. It's caused by hand washing and water on the, the skin, but it causes an eczematous rash. 
Um, also contact dermatitis. I mentioned before with the nickel allergy on the snaps, the rash itself kind of looks eczematous, even though it's not caused by atopic dermatitis. Numular dermatitis is just numular eczema. It's the eczema is the little round spots rather than in the distribution that we were talking about. Seborrheic dermatitis, where they produce too much oil and that can cause an inflammation that makes the skin have an eczematous rash. And then stasis dermatitis, which happens in adults. I've never seen it. <clears throat> How do you think about the different types of eczema? Yeah, and I've I've had a conversation with a dermatologist about this as well, and um, they kind of um, described similar to what you um, talked about here as using eczema as kind of an umbrella term or a, uh, a clinical symptom that the patient is having and using some of these other terminologies more so for the diagnosis because your treatment may differ a little bit depending on, you know, which of these you ultimately are diagnosed with. So, yeah, I, I kind of um, have experienced the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's helpful to think that eczematous skin could be one of these things, but atopic dermatitis is what we're talking about. That's the chronic relapsing condition, and it's often associated with the filaggrin mutation in the, the gene mutation and atopy and things like that, as opposed to these other eczematous rashes. So I always ask, and you already mentioned this a little bit, where is the rash located? Uh, it usually has a typical distribution that varies with age. And do you want to describe that, Dr. Pena? Sure, absolutely. So in your, in your um, patients who are generally young, like two years of age or younger, the areas that are more commonly where you develop the rash more commonly is the areas that are more susceptible to irritation. For instance, you know, in younger kids, they have drooling over their mouth and that drooling or um, anything that touches like periorally or even beyond that area on the cheeks, that's more prone to developing into eczematous lesions. As they um, uh, get older and start crawling, you have the extensor surface involvement, which you can see on the left side in this image. Of course, you can also have truncal involvement really at any age, but you can definitely see it in your younger patients. As you kind of transition to um, uh, toddler and beyond, you see the distribution move a little bit more to the flexural areas of the skin. So we see the neck, the antecubital fossas, the popliteal fossas, the ankle area. All of those um, tend to become more involved as the, the individual gets older. Um, and so that's how the distribution can vary depending on the age of the patient. Precisely. Um, I mean, it, it helps to know how long has it been present? Does it vary over time? Usually eczema starts pretty soon after birth and then it gets worse through early childhood. But in an older child, the rash starts to get better again. And um, it often starts out very severe and improves during the first few years. And that's been termed the atopic march. Uh, I'm not sure that I fully agree with atopic march, but it does indicate the course of eczema, the blue line. You can see at the very early age, it goes way up. It's terrible in the first few months of life. And then it slowly improves as the child gets older. Um, I usually recommend doing something just so that when they get better, you can get credit for it, but it's just a natural history of the disease. Food allergy comes very shortly after eczema. That's because eczema causes food allergy. It, the food gets absorbed through the skin and that's what sensitizes you to the food. And so shortly after severe eczema, you develop food allergy, then asthma forms, and then rhinitis tends to come later, even though all kids in the first five years of age have chronic rhinitis. It's due to respiratory infections instead of allergies. Uh, your thoughts about the atopic march? Absolutely. I think those are all great points. And I think if I can add one additional point, um, this is generally um, a great summary of the evolution of eczema and the most common ages of onset and how it kind of improves over time. When you move beyond that, so when you have eczema present when they're coming, you know, literally, like literal uh, day of birth, or when you have eczema, quote unquote, eczema that's diagnosed really late in life, 
70 years of age, or I shouldn't say that's really late, but you know what I mean. Like if you're having a new onset diagnosis in an, in an older age individual, there are other diseases that you need to think about beyond atopic dermatitis. For instance, in a, in a, in a child who is born with it, um, if there's other features concerning for inborn errors of immunity, that's something that should be considered and evaluated. In an adult who's presenting with that, certainly we should ask about systemic symptoms and wonder if there is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma that's present, because that can look very similar to atopic dermatitis. So um, yeah, that's a great, this is a great summary of kind of the general pattern of that, as well as with atop the atopic march. And when you fall a little bit beyond that, there are some other things to to keep in mind as well. I do I do have one objection to this picture and you already referred to it a little bit. I'm almost 70 years old and I don't look stooped over with a cane. Yes. <laughs> that, that's a stereotype that 70, 90 is the new 70, I think. At least I hope. 100%. Anyway, <laughs> um, other things to ask about. Uh, I always ask about a seasonal pattern because eczema is often worse during the winter when the air is cold and dry. So a lot of kids are really bad in January, but once it gets to be April and May and things warm up and get more humid, the skin gets better. Um, but it may also get worse during the extreme heat of the summer. So right now, kids with eczema are sweating a lot and they're really hot and so they're scratching and that, that can make eczema worse too. It's a great time to get in the swimming pool. Um, I, I find that when I get a history, patients come in, I start asking questions, and some parents simply don't want to answer your questions. They, they seem almost like put out that you're bothering to ask the question because they came in to get allergy testing. That's all they want, They're focused on food. They want you to do a test. Why are you wasting my time asking these questions? And so just one point that I found that Maybe you disagree with this. Some parents won't answer unless you first assure them that you will do a test. Yes, if they want a test, I tell them up front, okay, I will do a test. That's all right. You don't have to convince me. You don't have to worry about it. Now that we know that I'm going to do a test, let's talk about the history of your child's eczema. Have you run into that? Oh, I think that is a struggle that almost all of us as allergists can relate with. What I find personally that helps full is a couple of things. When I start the visit, you know, I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Dr. Pandya. I'm your allergist. And then I say, you know, today here's here's how the visit will go. First, I will be start I will start by asking a lot of questions about what's going on. I'll ask a lot of details about it, some of them that may seem a little bit odd, but it's for me to get a full understanding and a full picture of what's going on with your child. Then afterwards, we'll talk about any testing um, that needs to be done. And we'll talk, lastly, we'll talk about um, the best ways that we can treat going forward. So I find that when I set up that expectation right up front, then that testing thing kind of leaves their mind and then they refocus on, yes, I am here to talk about the disease that my child has. And I find that that reorientation um, helps the, the clinic flow go a little bit smoother. Now, of course, you can do that and still have some people fixate on testing. Um, and uh, you can certainly say, you know, and, and at that point you can talk about the role that testing will play and what tests can be done. Um, it, it can become very challenging though um, in those um, visits, but I find that directing the visit right off the bat is one of the helpful tools that I have. Mm -hmm. It's particularly helpful if they've been referred by a dermatologist and feel that they already have an eczema plan and all the eczema stuff's been done. And the only reason they're here to see you is they want to test. Why are you wasting my time asking questions? I just want to test. It's, it, as you said, sometimes I have to explain to them that I can't order a test unless I know what to test for. And this history helps me to, to determine that. Um, that it kind of calms them down because some families just have very strong uh, expectations. And I think the bigger oh. point of that is also there's still a lot of misinformation that exists out there about um, the role of certain testing with atopic dermatitis. Um, mm. You know, there's still a widespread belief that 
um, eczema is caused by one of the top nine food allergens, and we must get tested for those, or we must get a broad test for all food allergens in order to optimally yeah. manage that. So it speaks to just generally how there is some work that needs to be done on a on a global sense about education with eczema. And I didn't really include any slides on testing in atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. It's it's infrequent that it actually helps because uh, the reaction that you get where the skin flares up due to a food is not IgE mediated. It's a type four reaction. So allergy testing is of no value at all. Um, families don't know that. Referring doctors don't know that. The expectations are that you'll do a test and that will tell them which food's causing it and it's just not true. So as you said, it helps up front to address that issue. Uh, I'd like to introduce a term called intertriginous. Have you ever heard that word before? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It typically refers to like the skin fold areas. We can talk about the groin yeah. or axle. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I call it intertriginous zones and the families are like, wow, he used a big word. Um, I'm, I always, it, it impresses people that I can say intertriginous. I say it two times fast, it's not so easy. It's where the skin folds. Uh, opposing skin surfaces come into contact, resulting in chronic skin occlusion. This leads to rubbing and friction. Uh, heat and moisture makes that worse. And ultimately, it involves the areas that are typical for eczema because eczema tends to occur in the intertriginous zones. There. <laughs> Aren't you impressed that I could say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I usually ask about triggers too. Uh, you'll often get the following replies if you ask about what makes your eczema get worse. Well, numerous foods make it worse, but I can't figure out which ones. I can't identify a food that triggers it, but I know there must be one. Uh, or perhaps there's no obvious triggers. Most families don't really observe what the triggers are. They're, they're not really paying attention to it. But Sometimes they do. What what kind of responses do you get? Yeah, I think um, in terms of environmental triggers, the the big ones that I tend to get and the ones that can be supported by doing some testing include pet or animal dander or animal hair. So yeah, you know when they're when they go to my uh, mom's house, um, the the child's grandparents' house and they're around the cat, all of a sudden they come flared back at home. Or um, we also know that, um, I mean, parents may not identify this right off the bat, but if they talk about kind of a, a daytime pattern of waxing and waning, and um, you can potentially, regardless of, I guess, the pattern, you can support um, testing with dust mite. And if you see dust mite sensitization, there is some something to be, uh, managed better about dust mite avoidance within the home that can lead to a little bit of improvement. But that's not something they'll talk, tell me off the bat. Really only the things that parents will tell me is potentially pets and then foods as well. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so there, there may be things that trigger it. Usually it's cold, dry air, hot weather, that type of thing. And then Sometimes also... Oh, sorry, if I can make one more point about that. Also, personal care products, um, especially things that have dyes, scents, parabens, um, you know, they'll, they, I have heard from parents like, oh, yeah, I switched to a scented detergent and all of a sudden my kid flared up again. So I think irritants, yeah. the role of irritants as well in atopic dermatitis can be a, tr a flare. Very precisely, um, irritants, uh, crawling around carpeted, carpeting, wool, wool clothing, yeah. stuff like that, anything yeah. that's irritating. Uh, in terms of treatment, um, I always it's it's good to get a history of what treatment they've already tried. I ask about emollients. That's a great word too. Emollients is just something you put on the skin to uh, moisturize and 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 soften the skin. Is the definition of a an emol emollient? Um, and I ask them about emollients that they have been or currently are being used. Most families have something, but they don't know what it is. So they'll look blankly at you and say, well, I got a, a, a pink tube or the dermatologist gave me a, a, a tub of stuff. Sometimes they'll tell you it's uh, Lubriderm or shea butter. Or th there's all kinds of things that people use, but if it's a prescription medicine, they don't know what it is. I ask if the treatment helps to avoid 
I, the reason I ask about it is because if they know the name of the treatment and tell me that it didn't work, I won't re-prescribe it. It helps to not re-prescribe an ineffective treatment, but most of the time the families really don't know what they're on. Uh, I also ask them if they've ever tried wet wraps. And some families have used it and have heard of it and they say, oh yeah, it, it works great or whatever. Others kind of give you that puzzled kind of uh, deer in the headlight in the eyes um, look that they don't have any idea what you're talking about. Those families have not used it because if they had, they would know what you're talking about. And also bleach baths. Um, when I ask, have you used bleach baths? They immediately look of horror. They assume that you mean pouring bleach over the skin, which is not what you mean, but that's what they immediately think. So you have to assure them that we're not pouring bleach on the skin. We're basically recreating swimming pool water, which is a good analogy, and that calms them down. They may or may not have ever heard of that either. What, what do you think, Dr. Pandya? Yeah, I think, um, you know, some it, it is one of the things that can happen in atopic dermatitis that leads to parental frustration and also leads to a difficult appointment too is not knowing what treatments they've been prescribed because by the time they get to your office they've probably been prescribed a milieu of different topical steroids they don't know the names of them they're like yeah i have this blue tube and i have this yellow tube one of the features of emr which can um, help a little bit with that is pulling up their external pharmacy history so then i have exactly what they've been prescribed and then i go i can go through those individual agents but Certainly, when they come to you, generally, they may or may not remember it. And then wet wrap therapy, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's certainly, um, you know, most individuals are un unfamiliar with that. Um, and we'll talk about bleach baths a little bit later as well. We will. Okay, let's talk about emollients. <clears throat> it's something you have to spend a lot of time on. And the most common ones are creams and ointments. Um, what's the difference between a cream? and an ointment. Cream, creams are equal parts oil and water. They're easily absorbed and they can cover large areas of skin, but they tend to stay on the skin's surface to reduce moisture loss. It's the, the water gets into the skin and gets absorbed and the oil sits out on top and prevents moisture loss. It's got a smooth texture, thicker consistency than lotions and may offer a better alternative to avoid the greasy feel that may, many more oily based products leave behind. So that's the creams. Ointments, on the other hand, are about 80% oil, so they're much more oily. They stay on top of the skin. They're not really absorbed very much because the oil stays on the top and it's only the water part that gets absorbed. They tend to have a thicker consistency than cream, and they work well for extremely dry skin because the thick oil-based formula helps trap the moisture inside after the skin's been hydrated. Um, when you make a prescription for emollients, do you usually prescribe cre creams or ointments? I'd say generally, you know, ointments are um, more favorable because they get more of that oil, which helps the rehydration of the skin. Mm -hmm. But you also have to balance that with family ability to use it because some parents are like, you know, it's just too greasy. I hate using it. And if you're prescribing something that they'll, they're telling you off the bat, I'm not going to use this because I don't like the way, you know, I have to put it on the skin, then, you know, I, I kind of talk about what will work best for the family. But I, I will say that if you're looking for optimal moisture, moisturization of the skin, I do tend to favor the ointments. Yeah, well, ointments are greasier. Think of Vaseline. Yeah. Some people don't really like how Vaseline feels when it's on your skin. It makes your clothes stick to it and all that, but it does last a long time, whereas creams, there's some of that, but it's kind of a compromise between that and also some getting absorbed, because if you want the steroid to get absorbed into the skin and reduce inflammation, you need a little bit of that too, which kind of gets us to lotions and gels, because uh, lotions generally work well for a combination of normal skin that doesn't need the oil content. So lotions don't have any oil, they just get absorbed. So if you uh, have a steroid that you just wanna get into the skin, but you're not looking to create a moisture barrier, a lotion might be something that would be good. Uh, our nurses use lidocaine lotion to numb the skin before we give and uh, do a blood draw, for example. And then gels, gels uh, contain a combination of cellulose, water, and alcohol. They hydrate without leaving a, a residue. Skin may absorb gels so quickly, no moisture barrier 
remains. A good example of a gel would be like aloe. When you burn your skin, you want it to get in really fast. You don't necessarily need a residue to be left on the outside of the skin. Do you ever use lotions or gels? Yeah, I think, um, you know, some of the formulations of the topical, you know, even the medications can be available in, in lotions and gel, depending on how high of potency of topical steroid you're trying to target for. But beyond that, if we're just talking about emollients alone, um, you know, I'll, certainly lotions are pretty favorable to use. Um, again, I, I tend to stick with the ointments and creams before um, primarily to get optimal moisturization. And there's a couple of other things to think about. In a lot of the commercial like moisturizers, we're talking about like just, just the moisturizers, no medication in them. There's things that we need to consider. Firstly, they can contain additives that can lead to secondary contact dermatitis. Um, or worsening of your atopic dermatitis by one of two reasons. You can develop sensitization and then develop contact dermatitis, say for instance, to something like lanolin, um, which is in the commercial product Aquaphor, or um, if a product has, let's say, benzyl alcohol in it, that is a known irritant, which can lead to further drying of the skin, which can lead to further worsening of the eczema. Also, the products can, again, have fragrances, dyes, parabens in them, which are known irritants to anyone with atopic dermatitis. So I think those are all things that we need to think about when we're recommending the optimal um, you know, moisturizing agent. And one last thing, um, if I can make a point here about this, using the distinction between fragrance-free and unscented. Unscented is a, is a designation that um, products use or companies use, which can be very confusing. It has a fragrance in it, and then it has a masking agent on top of it to mask the fragrance. So your patient is still getting exposed to the thing that can irritate their skin. Whereas products that are labeled as fragrance-free generally are free of those irritants. So all things to think about when you're recommending the optimal moisturizing agent. Yeah, so this is a good comparison table I found that you, I, you might want to put on the wall of your little cubby that you work in if you work in a cubby like I do. Um, it just kind of tells you the difference between the different types of products and when they would be used. OK, before going into treatment, I think it helps to tell the patient why, what is eczema? Why do they have it? Because most, most families come in and they're kind of puzzled. It keeps coming back. That says, is it an allergy? It's, it, they're told the name of it, but they don't really have any idea what's going on in the skin. And they want to know why their child has eczema. Uh, vague answers like it's a skin disease or an inflammatory process or whatever. That, that's not very satisfying to most families. They would like a little bit more specific information. So I usually tell my parents a story and everybody kind of has their own approach to doing this. Um, I usually tell them that eczema is a genetic condition and it's caused by a mutation in filaggrin. I, I know that not all eczema is caused by a mutation in filaggrin, but many cases of eczema are caused by this. And it is a good uh, example of the type of thing that would cause eczema. Uh, it, whatever it is that's mutated, it creates a moisture barrier on the skin, and when it's defective, the moisture evaporates out of the skin, causing it to dry out. This causes itching, leads to scratching, leads to inflammation, leads to more itching. It becomes a vicious cycle, and, and I tell them that that's why you keep getting the eczema. I also emphasize that allergies do not cause eczema. As a matter of fact, eczema causes allergies. Once you have allergies, the allergies can trigger the eczema, but eczema doesn't cause it. If you get rid of all the allergies, you still have the eczema. Uh, what, how, what story do you tell your parents? Yeah, I think I, I tell a little bit of a similar story, but I basically say that, you know, um, your child was essentially born with this skin disease, um, and this skin disease um, has Thing, has certain properties where you lack certain molecules and proteins or you overproduce other molecules and proteins that leads to the diseased skin. So that's kind of like what I tell them on that surface level. We, of course, know that there are details within that that are true. You have overproduction yeah. of IgE. You have lack of natural moisturizing factor, which is an actual factor. It's called 
natural moisturizing factor. You have over you have um, overproduction of your epithelial cyto cytokines, IL-33, IL-25, TSLP, which lead to your TH2 overproduction, which leads to your whole TH2 cascade. We know that on a scientific level, that's true, but just distilling it down in a way that parents can kind of digest the information is that your child was born with this condition. Their skin is abnormal because they have over underproduction, however you choose to explain that. And that is why they have the, the skin disease. It's not something you're doing. It's not something they're doing. This is something they were born with. Now, you know, we know that there are things that they can do to optimally manage it, but that's the reality. It's it's not one thing alone that they're doing. It's not what they're ingesting if they're breastfeeding or what choice of formula that they're, you know, using with the child that's leading to the eczema. And I love was, the I love the third bullet point on here because um, it it leads us to um, so allergies do not ca cause eczema. Instead, atopic dermatitis or eczema causes allergies. We know that in individuals who have atopic dermatitis, your IgE level, the IgE itself is driven up. It's, it's higher. And we know that higher IgE levels are associated with disease severity in atopic dermatitis. But when you have higher IgE levels, you have more likely um, specific IgE levels that are elevated as well, which can lead to false positive or different levels of testing and thresholds in atopic dermatitis compared to non-atopic dermatitis. So that's an important point for us to remember too, because it's one of the issues with food allergy testing. We know that they have a higher IgE level. We know that they have higher specific IgEs to foods. So, um, so anyway, those are all great points that we talked about here. Exactly. And basically, it's the itch scratch cycle. Um, you itch, you scratch, the barriers damage, the allergens and everything enter, causes inflammation and redness, which makes it itch more, and it goes around and around and around. What we need to do is we need to stop this cycle. Um, it, sometimes, do you, do you ever measure the severity of eczema, Dr. Kanya? I mean, there's there's a variety of different tools that can be used for it. This is one of them. It's called the Eczema Area Severity Index or Easy Score. Uh, this is what's commonly requested by insurance companies when you're applying for a biologic. Do you ever measure severity? Great question, Dr. Portnoy. I'd say that this is the most commonly used, that the index that I most commonly use. You have two other indices that you can use. One is called the in, in for global assessment, and the last is the POEM score. The POEM is similar to ACT. I mean, it's a family-driven score, like they fill it out themselves, but easy is generally what most insurance companies um, use, which is ultimately why I use this scoring system most often. It's not that hard to calculate. You basically look at the different areas and you judge the head, neck, trunk, and so on for erythema, swelling, scratching, lichenification, and then you do the math. I've got a spreadsheet that does the math because it's a little bit complicated. And to have severe eczema, you need a score of 21.1 or greater. And it's, it's interesting how all of the patients I apply for a biologic seem to have a score that's at least 21.1 or, or higher. It's funny how that works. And there's actually a website called easyscore.com, which I'm putting in the chat, which um, is a calculator where you just drag and drop um, you how you feel the degree of eczema is for each of these regions, and then it auto calculates the score for you. Um, it can be super helpful and make that calculation a little bit quicker as well. Precisely. Um, okay, so let's talk about different treatments for eczema, and probably the most important one is bathing. Um, frequency of bathing, it, it turns out that more frequent is better. Uh, it should be a soaking bath until the fingers are wrinkly. That's how I describe it, the 10 minutes or so. Uh, as soon as they get out, the moisturizer should be applied to the skin while it's still wet to keep it from drying out. So otherwise, if you don't do that, then the skin will dry out and it'll get worse. Now, many parents have been told that bathing should be infrequent to avoid drying the skin out. Uh, that, that's what they come in with. Uh, those are the old recommendations that, that, that were made 20 years ago. That was the recommendation. 
it's changed now we know more. Um, so the whoever gave them that information has not kept up with the new information. Uh, the benefit of more frequent bathing should be mentioned gently. I don't tell them, well, your doctor was wrong. I, I kind of just say, well, we have new information now that suggests that more frequent might be better. Most kids actually like to be bathed. So the parents are happy that they can bathe their kids more frequently and they don't usually mind putting the lotion on more often. Um, how, what do you think? Yeah, I think one of the barriers that can come from parents is that um, bathing, it, depending on this de degree of eczema, can be painful for the child if they have such severe dis uh, disease severity. Um, however, if you get into the cycle of starting to do it, making bath time fun, it can ultimately just lead to benefit for the patient. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about bleach baths. Um, bleach baths reduces bacterial colonization on the skin. Mostly it's staph aureus is what's on the skin. Um, it's important to give a formula so they know how to make a bleach bath, about a half a cup of bleach to a bathtub full of water. That's not very precise. You can do ounces and gallons or milliliters and whatever, but this is a rule of thumb. Um, the child should bathe in it for about five minutes. The entire body should be bathed in the bleach Water solution helps to reduce uh, bacterial colonies. Jump, gently rub the moisture on the skin within three minutes of getting out of the bath. And you can repeat that two or three times a week until the skin is better. I've heard conflicting opinions about whether when you get out of the bleach bath, you should put a or spray a dilute um, solution of acetic acid to neutralize the high pH of the bleach. Um, it, some, some experts say you should, some say you shouldn't. I don't have an opinion about that one way or the other. It does seem like it's one extra step, um, but it is helpful to at least rinse the bleach off before you put the moisturizer on just so that it's not so irritating. Um, what do you tell your patients about bleach baths? Yeah, I think this is one of the topics that has quite a bit of variability from allergists because there's so much variability on data. There's some data that show that bleach baths are excellent and we should use them. And there is other data showing that um, when you compare it head to head to soaking, as you mentioned in the previous slide, that it's um, doesn't have significant difference in outcomes. Um, what I will say is if you have issues with infections or staph colonization, that is the the patient population that I would use it for. Um, uh, generally, apart from that, um, I try to optimize other therapies as well um, because I know there's conflicting data beyond, behind it. Yeah, and bleach baths basically reduce bacteria. So if they have a history of infections, I'm very reluctant to prescribe systemic antibiotics. Um, topical antibiotics like mupirocin are okay. Okay, but you can even become resistant to that. I don't know of any ba bacteria that are bleach resistant. Yeah. And of course you wanna do it safely. So these are some things you can tell parents. Yeah. What about wet wraps? Yeah, what do you tell your parents to do about wet wraps? Yeah, I think wet wraps are a little bit of an underutilized therapy that can lead to pretty good improvement of the of eczema. Um, we actually talked about this in our board review with our fellows this morning. So with, with, with wet wraps, you can do it one of two ways. Generally, the principle of wet wraps is that you apply it when the patient has, you know, taken a shower, their skin is mildly damp, and you apply some type of either medication or you don't use the medication. You just use a moisturizing agent and then you have an occlusive agent which you've run under the water, wrung dry, and then applied to the area. Um, generally for that we use only mild potency topical corticosteroids and it can lead to improvement of um, atopic dermatitis, especially if you have like very localized areas. Um, they also make sleeves which you can buy off of like Amazon where you can apply that like to the whole arm or even like onesies that you can apply to the entire like body um, for children. Yeah, putting it in certain locations can help. I've seen some kids uh, were told, well, put them in pajamas and cover their whole body. Kids hate that, parents won't do it. So as much as it's recommended by the experts, I've never had any success with that, but doing a single extremity or maybe both arms or at least the wrist, something like what you see in this picture, that, that can be very successful. Yeah. But let's talk about topical steroids. Um, 
we know that there's different degrees of steroids here. Um, the potency can be lower for sensitive skin areas such as the face and intertriginous zones. Um, then there's medium steroids that are good for the trunks and extremities and high potency only for severely like kenified skin. And if you don't let it get to that point, I don't usually use high potency steroids very often. Um, the side effects, of course, are yeah, um, they can get stria, skin atrophy, telangiectasia. It's a bunch of side effects that you could have. And kids are at greater risk of HPA suppression if you use it over large parts of the skin, uh, higher potency steroids. So something to at least be aware of. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And um, one of the common pitfalls, um, if I can talk about pitfalls of treatment, is not using a strong enough potency topical corticosteroids. So some um, individuals just stick to low potency and then the parents are frustrated because the kid's not getting better. Now, generally yeah. we don't use like the class one, like clobetazole 0.05% ointment. That's a pretty high potency for atopic dermatitis, but um, generally, you know, medium potency steroids should be at least trialed in these individuals, depending on the severity of their eczema. Yeah, you know, if a kid comes in with 1% hydrocortisone over the counter, I can at least bump them up to 2.5 and it'll still be low potency steroid. Right. Um, my recommendation, there's a whole bunch of steroids. I look at all the different tubes. The families tell you it's the pink tube or the blue tube. They don't know what tube they're, they're using. There's so many of them to choose from. It is very confusing. My recommendation is to become familiar with one or two from each group and just use those. Right, because, you know, they can end up with six or seven different topical steroids and it can be so confusing for them, which of them to use, where to apply it, et cetera. So sticking with minimal ones with clear instructions can lead to, to improvement. Um, calcineurin inhibitors, there's two of those that are available right now. One is called tacrolimus or protopic. The other one is pamicrolimus or elidil. Um, Protopic comes as a 0.1% for adults and a 0.03% for kids down you know, at two years of age. Um, it's more the, the higher concentration is more effective, but if you want a lower dose for young kids, you can use the lower concentration. Uh, uh, Elodil is approved for kids two years and older, and it's just one concentration. Here's the thing about calcineurin inhibitors. They're, they do kind of what steroids do, but they're not steroids. There's no risk of skin atrophy or acne. Um, there is a transient burning on the site and stinging that's pretty common. And there is a black box warning for, I think, Elodil because rat mice or rats got lymphomas. I'm not sure what it is. I think um, we tend to overlook or not worry too much about the black box warning because I'm not treating mice. <clears throat> And Do you actually, ever prescribe calcineurin inhibitors? Uh, definitely. I think the fellows can attest to that I use topical calcineurin inhibitors a lot. And the reason I do is because you're not limited on which areas of the body you can um, use them on. You can use them on the face. You can use them on the intertriginous zones. You can use them pretty much everywhere. And the other reason I really like using them is because they provide a great transition to maintenance regimens. So you have your treatment of what to do. Like, let's say, for instance, tacrolimus 0.03%. You use that twice a day until the skin clears. And then I tell the families, once the skin clears, we don't want to completely stop everything. We want to use this one to two to three times per week once a day to maintain that healthy skin. So the beauty about topical calcineurin inhibitors is that they allow for that easy transition. And there is there are studies showing that topical steroids are safe to use in that same fashion. But of course, we do get worried about some of those more systemic side effects you can get with steroids. And then lastly, if I can talk about the black box warning for malignancy, they did do a post hoc analysis on both tacrolimus and pimicrolimus longitudinally over many years with many different patients, thousands of pediatric patients who had used um, topical calcineurin inhibitors, and they saw no increased risk of malignancy. So it's more of a theoretical risk. Um, and I think there's even been petitions to remove that black box warning um, because the, the risk is more theoretical. We know that those exist, those risks exist with systemic, like when you ingest those um, yeah. agents as um, uh, immunosuppression. I kind of think of these as pretty safe medicines. Yeah, yeah. There is a uh, 
PDE prostaglandin DE4, prostaglandin E4 inhibitor. It's called, uh, it's an, it's called uh, Eucrisa. It's Eucrisa oral? I don't know. Have you ever used Eucrisa? I have used Eucrisa, or I should say Chrisa Borley, um, for individuals. Um, okay. It is approved in a younger age population, so you can use it in that time window from three months to two years of age, unless you use the topical calcineurin inhibitors off-label. Um, it does cause quite, it can cause burning of the skin, so there is um, some techniques of diluting it with lotion or with a moisturizer um, that can be helpful. Um, uh, but yeah, I've I've certainly used it for, and it's most helpful for mild to moderate um, atopic dermatitis, not your severe atopic dermatitis patients. Okay, let's talk about Janus kinase inhibitors, JAK inhibitors. The FDA has approved three JAK inhibitors for eczema, atopic dermatitis. I can't pronounce any of these. Uh, I'm sure that you're very very capable of pronouncing them. Um, the first one is a tablet for adults. Uh, the second one is a tablets for adults and children over age 12. So these are two tablets that are available for treating atopic dermatitis, but the youngest it goes down to is 12 years and older, though uh, there are studies ongoing for down to six years of age. Uh, there's also a topical uh, JAK inhibitor. It's a cream, a short-term treatment for people 12 and older with eczema. Have you ever used any of the JAK inhibitors? I haven't yet. I, um, you know, originally when Ruxolitinib was approved, it was approved at 18 and above, then they dropped it to 12 and above. So I am going to, I do, I have thought about using this particular therapy um, with the advent of biologics, you know, um, I, I haven't like used it quite yet. And then with the oral JAK inhibitor, um, Upacitinib approved for 12 and above, I haven't used that yet. Um, they certainly so look promising. Here's a uh, Rinbach. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the uh, tablets, uh, and you can see it's very effective. Um, but it's and there's the dosing that's available, but it's approved down to age 12. And then here's the um, the other one, Synbic. Oh, never mind. <laughs> it's approved <laughs> for adults Co, 18 yeah. and older. Um, but again, it's being studied down to to 12. Uh, and all of, all of them seem to give about an 80% improvement in the eczema. So they both seem to be pretty much the same efficacy over the same time period. And, and I would say an 80% improvement in eczema is, is pretty darn good. Yeah. And what about biologics? This is really what we have the most experience with. There are two of those. There's mm -hmm. a dupilumab and whatever, trichelokinumab. Trichelokinumab, yeah. Yeah, we don't know which is better. Head-to-head -head trials have never been done. But the one that we probably have the most experience with is dupilumab or dupixent. It's approved now down to six months of age and up, which is fantastic because those are the kids who need it the most. They have the most severe eczema. Uh, it blocks IL-4 and 13 from binding to cell resurfaces. It's approved for kids with uh, six and up with severe asthma too, which makes it even uh, doubly beneficial for those patients. And then there's a variable dosing depending on how old and how much the child weighs. What do you think about Epixent? It's a great agent, and I think it's really revolutionized the um, options we have for treatment for atopic dermatitis. Of course, there are some side effects that we need to think about with regards to conjunctivitis, um, hypersensitivity reactions um, that you counsel patients on, but generally it's a very favorable agent, um, and I love that it's been approved down to six months of age. It's Like I said, it's really revolutionized the way that we can treat severe atopic dermatitis. Yeah, it's because my good. My go-to for really bad eczema. Because we know that things like phototherapy exist out there for management of atopic dermatitis, but logistically it can be really difficult for the families to come once a week for a multi-hour session of phototherapy. And doing an injection, you know, once every two weeks or, or a month at home is way more favorable generally for families. I'll tell you, I'm reluctant to do phototherapy and methotrexate and cyclosporin in one-year-olds, it just bothers me. But if I can give a six-month-old Dupixin and have their eczema clear up, and I've seen that happen, it can be a miracle. Uh, the other drug um, is approved, but only for kids 18 and older, which isn't really kids, unless you think of adults as big kids, which I 
and deal. That's why we don't have as much experience with this agent at a children's hospital, but I'm sure at the adult hospital it's being used also. Have you ever used those? I haven't yet, no. No. Okay. Anyway, we're just about out of time. I would, I guess, to finish up, I recommend that if you see a patient with eczema, give them a step plan, which includes bathing daily with a soaking bath, applying emollient frequently during the day, starting with a low potency steroid, then a medium. Depends on how bad the skin is, mupirocin for infected areas, bleach baths, wet wraps. Consider step up to another treatment. If this doesn't work, it's pretty vague, but you can develop a step plan to give your patients that tell them kind of like an asthma action plan, how to treat their eczema as it gets better and worse. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Any final words about eczema, Dr. Pandya? No, the one other plug I just wanted to make is, you know, as um, providers who are managing eczema, once you have a treatment plan for the acute eczema, think about having a maintenance plan of what to do once that eczema clears up. Um, but yeah, we'll open it up briefly for any questions before Dr. Orman speaks. Any questions, anybody? Thanks for the presentation, guys. That was fantastic. Um, got lots of questions and comments. I'm going to save them for later. We will have uh, more talks on uh, eczema, atopic dermatitis in the near future, too.